We can clip her wing not too high, otherwise she bleeds. Let me just concentrate while I do this. And then we mark her as well, just it's easy to find the queen in a big box if she's marked. It's Western Australia's famous tourism destination, but Rottnest Island has another lesser known claim to fame. It's also home to what's probably the longest continuous queen bee breeding program anywhere in the world. Every year about 300 hives are shipped to Rottnest where nature takes its course hidden from view in the centre of the island. It's basically just a line breeding program. Colin Flay is one of eight commercial beekeepers who pool their resources to run what's known as the Better Bee Program. Why Rotnest? Uh, because it's far enough off the mainland. See, Rotnest is 16k off the mainland, a drone will fly eight and a queen will fly five, so that gives you 13k, so you've got a 3k buffer. So really the only drones that these queens can make with are the ones that we bring into the island. So that's the idea, everyone breeds from their best uh, queens, breeds drones, bring them over here, they're um, a bit slower to mature, so they have to come over early and then they fly, they mature, and then we bring the queens over to synchronise the uh, sexual maturation rates. And then they mate like most things do on Rotto, I guess, and then, uh, yeah, we'll find out on Tuesday how and we went. Back on the mainland, the queens are sorted to sustain an industry which has been closed to the rest of Australia for 40 years. The breeding program was started by the Department of Agriculture in 1980 because quarantine restrictions meant queens could no longer be sourced from the eastern states. There's a disease outbreak in South Australia called European fowl brood and the Department of Agriculture at the time didn't want to uh, get that disease into Western Australia. The department got stock donated from the industry and we established 20 breeding lines from the best stock that they donated. And once that was established, we used artificial insemination and homogenised semen to select the best queens in the program. Lee Allen started the program and now in retirement is still a keen participant. Well, as long as I can stand and, and keep going, I'll be, I'll be right here. Well, you can just go to the top of the class, Miss Bates. After nearly 40 years of continuous genetic improvement, the program's queens are renowned for their calm temperament and ability to breed bees, producing nearly double the global average of honey per hive. When we have brood capped, that means that the queen is the correct age and she's the right lineage. And so we can clip her wing not too high, otherwise she bleeds. And let me just concentrate while I do this. And then we mark her as well, just it's easy to find the queen in a big box if she's marked. Tiffany Bates has been breeding queens for the last six years for the University of WA. The best are worth up to $1,200 each, but most of the Rottnest queens are kept by the beekeepers in the program. Well, she's the breeder, really. So some people think that she's running things. That seems to not be the case. She can lay 2,000 eggs a day. She also pumps pheromones out from all different parts of her body, her feet, her abdomen, and the bees check on those pheromones all the time to make sure she's functioning properly. And if she's not, they'll supersede her, they'll make a new one. So it's a pretty ruthless situation. Um, but her job basically is just laying eggs and making sure that she's keeping the colony running in terms of pheromone production. So healthy queen, healthy hive? Absolutely. Yep. Young queen also makes a really big difference. If the queen's getting a bit old, um, the colony will start to be less productive and less <laughs> disease resistant. And then just put her back. She'll smell a bit like my fingers. The bees question her when she goes in, but then she's okay. It's not just the breeding program in WA that stands the industry apart here. Bioactive honey from the state's unique Jarrah and other forests has been discovered by the world, sparking a liquid gold rush. Oh yeah, they're all coming in now, mate. <laughs> As soon as people realise the worth of the product, because you know it sells itself. If you've got a good product that has major health benefits, well, then people are going to want it. And if there's a market that's quite, you know, got a, quite a premium on it due to the, you know, compared to the normal price, aren't 
prices are based on bioactivity, the level of medical and health giving properties in the honey, and the strongest have earned as much as $100 a kilogram in China. Independent testing of Jarrah and Mary honey in New Zealand last year found it had stronger antimicrobial properties than Manuka honey. Rather than talking about one is better than another, what we would like to see in a therapeutic manner is that in different situations you will use a different honey. Diversity is a very good thing uh, because uh, microbial resistance is something that uh, naturally occurs over time and so when we have a diversity of mechanisms of, of, of uh, dealing with microbial resistance what we end up is stronger, stronger therapeutic outcomes. Yeah, we've got a good range of honeys this year. I'm noticing that there's quite a bit of variation in colour here. Ken Dodds is running a $3 million research program at WA's Chem Centre Analytical Laboratory, helping build science-backed foundations for WA's emerging active honey industry. So far, tests have shown the WA product also has strong anti-inflammatory properties and is prebiotic, helping improve human gut health. Key to the research will be creating a certification system for the varied range of bioactivity in the forest honeys. Really what I'm doing is helping them produce something uh, more consistently and more clearly identifying for them the key attributes of those honey that they can then use in their marketing. And then the chemistry centre of course is providing the international certification that gives the credibility that enables them to get a really good price for the, their product. The Chem Centre project is part of a huge new focus on research and WA is now also home to a national collaborative research centre for honeybee products. It'll be based in this brand new $10 million facility north of Perth. And this is our laboratory here. Liz Barber is the new CRC's Chief Executive Officer. When we're full capacity, we're going to have, what's it, 26 projects actually running in the CRC. 16 of those are actually going to be run by PhD students. So it's just, it's going to be a huge cohort of people just all suddenly focusing, you know, on, all on honey at the same time. The research will target areas such as bee health and nutrition, beekeeper training, traceability and chain of custody fraud protection. What it does is that it actually connects us with everything that's happening internationally. And that's the most important thing, is keeping an eye on that we can actually translate immediately of something we see out there that we can actually bring to Australia and actually incorporate it in what we're doing. So that's what, what's so great about being a cooperative research centre, is you're very hands-on. You know, it's not you do the research and you're isolated in a laboratory. Um, we are very much involved with the industry. I mean, we've got more industry partners than we have researchers. The biggest risk to the industry is biosecurity, and the state is relying on border controls and nearly 50 sentinel hives, like this one near Fremantle. They're the first line of defence against introduced pests, such as the Varroa mite, which has devastated honeybee populations all over the world. Even with the best biosecurity measures, Australia is extremely vulnerable to the varroa mite. In fact, one international expert says it's a matter of when, not if, there's an incursion here. It's got to every other country in the world. Um, we live in a global community. Um, huge amounts of um, commodities are shipped around the world. And so it's just a matter of, you know, it will arrive at some point. Professor Stephen Martin is an international expert on bees and was the keynote speaker at the Queensland Industries Conference last year. He said varroa mite was a huge threat to Australia's bee populations, but it could be managed. It's killed millions of colonies. Um, everywhere it goes, there is a change in beekeeping, a change in attitude. You now have to start controlling uh, the mites. That involves putting pesticides into the colonies. Um, countries that didn't um, decide to treat, I think Czechoslovakia was one example, 
and uh, it lost you know, over a million colonies. Uh, almost all the colonies disappeared. Um, the other huge impact of the Varroa mite is you lose all your feral colonies. Um, so it, it changes things and you rely more heavily on the beekeepers to keep the bees going. Professor Martin said international research was now centred on Varroa resistant bees in Brazil and Africa to try to understand the genetics and breed immunity into bee colonies. The new honeybee product CRC says it's keen to join the international research effort using cutting edge proteomics. What you do is you actually see the protein profile of a bee that actually is resistant. And instead of us actually you know, exposing the bee to the disease, what we do is we look for those protein profiles and then we start breeding those bees up. And of course the big advantage is of course we've got one of the oldest breeding programs you know, here in Western Australia. Rottnest Island's Better Bee program has been central to maintaining a healthy chemical free industry in WA. Now it could also play a leading role in finding solutions to the biggest threat to bee populations around the world. Oh, you are getting into it now? Yeah, that'll be an essential part of the breeding queens. Because of its isolation on Rottnest Island, you could go and set up a permanent breeding program over there and supply the rest of the um, rest of the mainland with, you know, and you could trial Varroa, uh, you know, resistant stock and things like that. So yeah, the Rottnest Island project is sort of a, an integral part of the whole survival sort of mechanism we've got in plan, yeah.